Well, good afternoon, everybody, and a very warm welcome to another edition of More Tea Vicar. I guess with the news of a, another lockdown starting today, we will be drinking lots more tea and probably things a bit stronger as well. Having said that, uh, this morning I had a lovely walk on this beautiful day. I walked the Esplanade uh, through Greenhill Gardens and along the Preston Road to Overcombe. It was a glorious weather and the cruise ships were back because they obviously have retreated because of the recent storms. And I could see right, a, right around the coastline to Durdledore and to Lulworth Cove. A lovely, lovely walk this morning. It did raise my spirits um, a lot and I'm very fortunate uh, that I can get out and walk. But I'm very conscious that there are many of you who are having to be isolated at home. And please be assured I send you my love and my prayers. Well, the lockdown is here and all religious groups in England have strongly criticised uh, the rules banning communal worship. The Roman Catholic uh, bishops have given a statement saying that whilst we understand the difficult decisions facing the government, um, we have not yet seen any evidence whatsoever that would make the banning of communal worship with all its human cost a productive part of combating the virus. We ask the government to produce this evidence that justifies the cessation of acts of public worship. Prime Minister Boris Johnson, as you know, announced last Saturday that England would be under a new lockdown from today until the 2nd of December. Other than for funerals, the only other reasons places of worship can stay open is to broadcast acts of worship for individual prayer, childcare or essential services such as blood donation or food banks. Meanwhile, the Bishop of London, uh, Dame Sarah Mulally, chairwoman of the Church of England's recovery group, said she would study the new regulations and seek clarification on how public worship would be affected. Other Christian leaders have said that churches have put a great deal of effort into coronavirus measures and they are much safer than other settings which are still allowed to be open, such as secondary schools. Well, we await clarification at this time from our own Diocese of Salisbury. However, in the meantime, uh, Holy Trinity Church is closed for public worship. It is open on a Friday uh, morning from uh, 10 a.m. to 12 noon for individual private prayer. Please note that our Remembrance Sunday services are now cancelled, but um, they will be online. There will be a Remembrance Sunday service this Sunday morning with an act of worship online and you can find um, the service on our church website at www.holytrinityweymouth.org or on the church Facebook and YouTube channel so you can watch them at home and similarly the Advent carol service we had planned for Advent Sunday will also now not be taking place. In a letter written by our two archbishops to the Church of England, we are encouraged to pray, and I quote, This is a difficult and challenging time for all of us. We are sure that some of you reading this letter will wish we had made other decisions during the period of the first lockdown or even challenge the government harder on the decisions it has made. You may be right. However, it is our view that the best way we can serve our nation now is by pouring our energy into doing the things that we can do. 
which is to pray and to serve. We also dare to hope that we will be kind to each other and that God will give us the courage and humility we need to be faithful witnesses to the gospel of peace. Bearing in mind our primary vocation as the Church of Jesus Christ to pray and to serve, we call upon the whole Church of England to make this month a lockdown, a month of prayer. More than anything else, whatever the nation thinks, we know that we are in the faithful hands of the risen Christ, who knows our weaknesses, tiredness and struggles, and whose steadfast love endures forever. And that is a quote from um, a letter sent jointly by the primates of the Church of England, um, the Archbishop of Canterbury and York. Well now for some other news. Last weekend was the Feast of All Saints and last Monday the Feast of All Souls. Prayer days, outdoor services and light displays took place in churches and cathedrals as part of an effort to reach tens of thousands of people coping with bereavement amid the coronavirus pandemic with a message of comfort and hope. Our own cathedral in Salisbury marked All Souls Day with an afternoon devoted to prayer with visitors invited to light a candle for a loved one and chaplains and clergy on hand to offer pastoral support. People also had the chance at that service to dedicate a flower in memory of those who have died. At Holy Trinity on All Souls Day we had a, a very moving Requiem Eucharist. It was prayerful and the music was wonderful including the Adagio by Albanini and Barber as well as I Know That My Redeemer Liveth by Handel and concluding with uh, Rutter's Gaelic Blessing. My thanks go to James and to our Holy Trinity Church Choir. Well, new resources have been published recently to encourage a shift in the church's understanding of vocation. Work to encourage lay Christians to see their roles in daily life as a vital part of the ministry of the church has been given support in a new report published this month by the Church of England. Well, I have read some of this report and I would comment that this is what many of you faithful Christians and worshippers have been doing all your lives quietly and prayerfully in church, in your homes and families as well as your workplace. And although the report was interesting, I rather felt that the need to affirm everyone about everything all of the time um, uh, particularly people who are living out their faith in the world, was something that perhaps needs not shouting about and affirming, as much as living it out quietly for all to see as fellow human beings were all are valued and affirmed. And finally, our news this morning is just to thank you, those of you who are continuing to send in letters and emails about the sadness that they feel about the Church of England becoming over bureaucratic and in so doing reducing parish clergy who have been and still are the backbone of mission that is the glue which holds the Church of England together. We hope that enough people will write to archdeacons and bishops and archbishops in the hope that this will receive further discussion and debate at both diocesan level and at General Synod. Well, that's all our news today. Like everything else, most of it's centred around COVID. But let's lighten everything a little bit now as we have a little musical interlude with James, Thomas and Lizzie Peacock and some music from Handel. 
Well, thank you for that uh, glorious piece of music uh, from Handel. Well, it's been um, a great pleasure in the last couple of weeks for me to be able to meet up with uh, one of our uh, councillors for our electoral uh, ward of Wyke and Rodwell. I met up with councillor Claire Sutton and uh, between us we explored some of the issues facing Weymouth, our parish and our area. Here's the first part of that interview. Well, I'm here today with Councillor Claire Sutton, who is one of three uh, councillors here in Weymouth, representing the ward of Rodwell and Wyke. Good afternoon, Claire, and very warm welcome. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. Lovely to be here. Let's go back to the beginning. Uh, what made you become a councillor? Um, well, it's not quite the idealistic story that you might... Imagine, um, I, I'd, I'd always been quite political. I, in fact, I joined the, the Labour Party in my, my teenage years. Um, but uh, at around the age of 35, I was moving back to Weymouth with my husband and children. And, and my, my mother was asked if she'd like to, to stand for the local council. And she said, uh, um, no thanks, but my daughter might. Um, <laughs> and I, I, I needed a job. Um, and uh, I've always been very community spirited. Um, so I thought, well, you know, let's let's try that for a job interview. You know, I've got lots of doors in Rodwell, and um, happily I was um, elected. Yeah. So Claire, you're the leader of the Green Party on Dorset Council. Um, why the Green Party? Uh, well, it's a very good question. I was originally elected as a Labour councillor, and. Uh, Became disillusioned for a number of reasons. There were there, there were lots of very um, decent individuals, um, but uh, so I didn't stand for re-election. And then I I, uh, I did a degree in a master's degree in climate change, um, as I had an increasing concern, obviously, about the environmental agenda. Um, and then I I thought I I really want to do something to to further this agenda. Um, but it's also, if you actually, you know, read the small print of the Green Party policies, um, social justice is also extremely um, important and, and absolutely at the, at the core of the Green Party's values. So I think when you join a party, you know, if you join a political party, what you do is align yourself with the one, you know, you're not a slave to, to, that, to any doctrine, but that it's the one that aligns most closely with your values. And then the Green Party from an environmental and a social justice perspective um, definitely aligns most um, closely with my, my own personal values. I mean, we know, we, we've heard a lot about the environmental perspective yeah. uh, and le lately, and, and, you know, absolutely right that we need to highlight that and push that more. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about the social justice side of the things that you, you're promoting as a member of the Green Party. Well, on the national level, it's things like, um, you know, the, the, the Green Party was, I think, the first party to advocate renationalisation of the railways, which um, one would one would think is is long overdue. Mm -hmm. um, on a on a on a very very local level, um, I think you know you, you carry through, or you try to carry through your actions and your priorities, the the values that you hold. So you know I I I, I really try to focus more of my energies on a local level, on families and um, communities which need it, which need it most, um, yeah. Okay, I've always thought sort of social justice was mm. more like sort of um, um, defending people who are in minority groups and am I right or am I? Um, well, it has, you're absolutely right, but it has a very strong um, economic um, driver as well um, in the sense that Obviously, you know, irrespective, you, you know, you're absolutely right about the equalities, diversity agenda, um, but also, um, if you're if you're born into, you know, a, a relatively poor family, obviously your life chances statistically are just so much poorer. So I suppose that's where I'd 
I'd use the language of social justice in the sense that yeah. that's not strictly fair. So mm -hmm. what you should be doing um, on, on, a, on a personal level and on a political level is actually trying to, to balance things up a bit. Well, what was it do you think that people were most concerned about in the last elections which led to you and your colleagues representing us as Green Party members for uh, this ward? Um, I think, generally speaking, um, in a ward like this, the main motivating factor is probably not the fact that we are green, it's that we have a track record that we're well trusted within the community, um, we, we, we work really hard, um, and pe people know that we're there to help, we, we communicate very well as well. But there is something else going on, isn't there, that people are becoming a lot more aware of environmental issues mm. in general. And whether, I think lots of individuals in Rockwell and White, they wouldn't vote green on a national level, but on a local level, they're very happy to because they feel it's a very positive statement about, about looking forward to, to the future. Mm. So, I know that I've had conversations with people and in church um, about the fact that they weren't terribly impressed uh, with making Dorset a unitary authority yeah. back in April 2019. Yeah. What would you have to say to those people? Um, I do understand it was quite controversial and my concern at the time was, and that's for a lot of people, was about politics moving, um, becoming more, more, more centralised mm -hmm. and, and moving away from the local area. However, um, I, I, was, I was a fairly strong supporter of it on, on balance um, because there was just so much duplication, so much confusion. People really didn't know whether to go to their borough councillor or to their um, Dorset county councillor. Um, and so there's lots of grey areas. Um, and that was very, very wasteful of resources as well mm. um, in, in terms of officer duplication. And um, I, 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 I'm, I know it's disappointing in a way perhaps that this largely comes down to money, but those resources really need to be spent within our communities as opposed to on additional democratic structures. So I, I genuinely think it was, a, it was a good thing, but what we do keep a really close eye on is not losing um, the, the local focus, obviously. Yes, because there are, there are those who have said to me, certainly, that you know, the sadness about becoming a unitary council is that um, it's decisions are being made by people who perhaps don't even know Weymouth. Um, is there truth in that? Um, there is some truth in that. However, a lot of the decisions that really matter were being made at that level anyway. Okay. So for example, if you're talking about decisions about local schools, about social care, about infrastructure, these decisions were being made at that level anyway. Um, and decisions which are very specific to Weymouth, some of those are still now made at Weymouth Town Council. So, um, yeah, I, I think on balance, I understand the concerns, but on balance, I think it was the right way to go. Well, a huge thank you to Claire um, for agreeing to come and uh, do an interview uh, with me um, on her role and some of the issues facing um, our particular area of uh, Weymouth. And as I say, the second part of that interview will be on next week's programme. So let's have our hymn today. And so I'm going to hand over to James, who's going to introduce it. And today's hymn is number 187, Jerusalem, My Happy Home.
Well, thank you for that uh, lovely hymn. Our heavenly Jerusalem, the place where we all hope to be one day. Well, now it's time to take another visit to Devon. And today we're visiting a very superstitious village. Well, here I am today in um, a very quaint, quirky little place with the name of Shebier on Dartmoor. It's a lovely day as we look towards St Michael's Church, Shebier. Probably uh, Shebier is best known for its co-educational independent school, one of the oldest Methodist foundations in the country. It is said that John Wesley uh, came to Shebier where the Bible Christian Church was founded here and where Wesley independently ordained his own minister, William O'Brien. St Michael's Church was built in the 11th century. I've not been able to get in uh, today, however, um, I have had a look around the outside and I see that uh, St Michael's is in on the historic churches at risk register and as I look around the church I can see see why um, there's, it's in very poor condition in places with with damp and will soon need a new roof lots of vegetation growing um, out of the building also church itself has six bells and above the south porch like most of these Devon churches a lovely lovely sundial which in fact tells it's amazing isn't it tells the right time lovely to see that there's loads of memorials on the walls of this church but probably the most fascinating thing of the outside of this church are these incredible stone corbels these stone corbels. I've never seen such lovely faces on them. They're beautifully carved and they're not grotesque. I mean they're friendly looking faces. My suspicion is that these are probably faces of patrons of the church or of the manor. And I've not seen them on the outside of a church before in this way. The church has obviously had some kind of repair work uh, done to its stonework. Notice that the Devon soil and stone tends to be rather red in colour, very acidic. So as we walk up the church hall on your left you can see now the priest's door. You can imagine the old days the priest scuttling in to take the Sunday service and then back out again afterwards. So as we come up the path now, we're just going to have a look at the east end of the church, traditionally, of course, where the altar would be. And you see another couple of stone corbels. And these fascinated me because these had crowns on them. Probably Shebia is best known for the Devil's Stone, which is on the village green. It's a local custom that... Um, Every year the bell ringers come and ring the bells at the parish church and then nip outside the gate of the church where the village green is and um, with their shovels and tools and they turn the stone. You're about to see the stone. No one knows when the annual ritual of turning the stone began but it's uh, to frighten the evil spirits away. And there's only one known occasion when the custom didn't take place during the First and Second World Wars. Bad luck followed both times and ever since the annual turning of the Devil's Stone has taken place. Fascinating. And the stone is not um, a local stone so nobody seems to know how it's got here. And here are the bell ringers from St Michael's turning the stone. What a weight. 
So here we are at the centre of this pretty little village. Really quiet today and I'm looking at the Devil Stone Inn. See how peaceful it is. And there's the Devil. Apparently it's uh, meant to be one of the most haunted pubs in the UK. Lovely visit to Shabir. It was so quiet, it was almost eerie. Well, that was a lovely, lovely visit. And I have to say, in the time I was there, I did not see a soul. But what friendly faces those stone corbels had, don't you think? Well, it's time for our reflection today now. And it's uh, about salt and yeast. Well, good morning. And uh, it's a beautiful morning uh, this morning. I've been watching wild geese fly over. And in the background, you might hear the, the combines working. I've been thinking this morning about uh, a passage from St Matthew, chapter 15, verse 13. And it says, you are the salt of the earth. Salt and yeast have a number of things in common. Both come in tiny granules and are used for enhancing food. I don't like salt very much on my food, uh, but uh, I know how precious it has been um, in the last um, few weeks when I have uh, had a sore uh, mouth. And I've been gargling in salt because it has that great healing power. But by the time the food is eaten with salt in it and the yeast has been put in the dough, it becomes pretty invisible. But the contributions they make are very noticeable. Because yeast, of course, makes the dough rise when you're baking bread and salt is both a seasoning and a preservative and a healer. So when we hear that passage this morning from scripture, you are the salt of the earth. Here Jesus is teaching us about quiet behind the scenes work in the kingdom of God that can make a big difference in people's lives. I met uh, a nurse some years ago. She was a fairly shy person who didn't say much but loved her work and she served with dedication and discipline. And She told me once that as she came off her shift one night at 11 o'clock, a colleague said, I realise tonight that whenever I'm on the same shift as you, the work seems to go better. And that surprised me because often I hardly even notice you are there. To Jesus, though, that's not surprising. When we live out our calling to be salt and yeast, we leave noticeable blessings behind. A great friend of mine from my last parish who, I have to say, was exceedingly wealthy, one day passed me a large sum of money to be given to a struggling family in our community. And the family were greatly relieved and asked for the donor's name so that they could say thank you. And I urged them simply to thank God for the love and care they received. so peaceful here. Dying to desire 
to be noticed can leave behind powerful, unforgettable blessings. Have a nice day and uh, God bless. Well, we've come to the end now of uh, another week's programme. My word, it uh, goes so quickly. But I hope you've enjoyed uh, this week's offering. May I encourage you as we move forward and we continue in this situation of lockdown to pray. To pray as our archbishops have encouraged us to do. The power of prayer is very significant as we all know and we can't do much but we can pray and we're going to have our prayers now and until i see you again next week uh, please stay safe stay warm and stay well god bless